The Legend of the Nautilus by F. A. Steele. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Long, long ago, when people were not nearly so wise as they are nowadays, when they did not know how many millions of miles away the sun is, but firmly believed the moon to be made of green cheese, there lived a little child, a happy little child, that awoke with the dawn, played all day, and slept all night, just as happy little children ought to do, no matter how wise the world becomes. Now, when it was quite a wee baby, it went to bed so early that it did not know what darkness meant, and used to think people were talking nonsense when they spoke of the silent night. But as it grew older, it naturally became less sleepy and sat up later, until the shadows lengthened, the daylight faded, and the red sun dipped down behind the trees and at last it sat up so late that it saw the grey twilight creep over the world. And then, one bedtime, the dark mantle of night enfolded the flowers and birds and the little wandering child. At first it was frightened and hid its eyes, but after a time it forgot to be afraid and began, as children will, to ask questions. It would watch with wide-open, puzzled eyes until the last glamour had gone from the sky, and then it would turn to its mother and say, Mother, what becomes of the light when the sun goes out? But the mother only laughed, and bade it not be silly. So it sat silent, but for all that it kept on wandering, till its little head ached where the light went when the sun goes out. It asked the fire, thinking that would be sure to know, as it went out often, and had, besides, a nice ruddy light of its own. But it laughed also, and said it didn't know, and didn't care, since the light always came back when it was wanted. The candle suggested it might go into the snuffers, but the chimney declared it knew nothing unless the light hid in the smoke. The sun has no smoke, said the child, shaking its head. I'll ask the sunflower. It must know, since it follows the sun all day. What becomes of the light when the sun goes out? echoed the sunflower tossing its head in a superior way. Why, what a little stupid you are! The sun never goes out. It goes to another place and comes back next morning. I know that, persisted the child, but it is the light, not the sun. Look at that yellow light on the wall. See how it creeps up and up, by and by, it will climb into the western sky and disappear. Where does it go? Nowhere, cried the sunflower in a pet. That is the stupidest question I ever heard. The light is nothing. Just at that moment, however, it left her face, and she had to turn her head to follow it. So the conversation came to an end. But the child sat thinking, and this is what it thought. If the sunflower follows the light, it must go somewhere. So that night, as it lay cozy in its little bed, the child plucked up courage to ask the moon, which peeped in upon it kindly through the window. What becomes of the light when the sun goes out? echoed the moon, surprised. Why, it stays, of course. Don't you see it in my face? Is that sunlight? asked the child 
doubtfully. It looks so cold and pale. Come up here and feel how warm it is, retorted the moon scornfully. I can't help your having bat's eyes. I can see it quite plain. Now, in those days, children generally believed what they were told. So the child lay satisfied, telling itself it knew where the light went at last, and wishing it had not bat's eyes, when all of a sudden something dark began to creep over the edge of the moon. "'Is there anything the matter, moon?' it asked anxiously. "'It looks as though the light were going.' "'Nothing, nothing,' cried the moon hurriedly. "'You are in the way, that is all.' But the shadow grew and grew, till at last the moon hung like a dark ball in the heavens, and though the light came back again quickly— the child was no longer satisfied, but lay wondering where the light went when it left the moon. So the next day, when it sat watching the sun dip down behind the trees, it made up its mind to follow the sun as far as it could, and find out what became of the light when it went out. It unlatched the garden gate and ran swiftly down the dusty road, startling the sleepy birds from their nests in the tall hedges until it came to a forest where it could only see a glint here and there through the grey gnarled trees redder and redder grew the sky till as the child came out upon a rising moor stretching into the blue distance the sun was close to the horizon i shall be too late I shall be too late, cried the child breathlessly, as it ran heedless of stones and briars. The light faded from the heather and crept up the little figure with its outstretched hands and backward streaming hair. On and on it ran, with the sunset glow upon its flushed face. Stay, please stay one moment, dear son, it pleaded but in vain. The last gleam died away, and, wearied out with fatigue and disappointment, the child stumbled and fell. But kind Knight, who is always so good to the tired children, took the little wanderer in her arms, and sleep whispered dreams as a lullaby, till dawn, peeping from the east, awoke the child, and there was the light once more claiming the world for its own all that day the little traveller travelled from east to west and answered hopefully to the passers-by i am going good people to find out what becomes of the light when the sun goes out that is all but when night came it was no nearer the horizon than before so Day after day, the child sped on, till, wearied and flushed, it arrived at last upon the shore of the sea, just as the sun was setting, and lo, a bright ray of rippled light stretched from the horizon, and, ever widening, touched the child's tired feet as it hurried to the brink. It is the road at last, it cried exultantly the road to nowhere. So saying, it ran on and on into the sea, careless of the increasing depth. Then the pitying waves took the little wanderer in their cold hands and laid the child back softly on the beach. Go home, baby, they said. The big ocean is not for such as you. But I only want to find out what becomes of the light when the sun goes out, pleaded the child. Perhaps you can tell me. Not we, laughed the waves. It leaves us and goes somewhere else, though we stretch right over the edge of the world. Perhaps the sunflower was right after all, and it goes nowhere, thought the child. I must find out where nowhere is. I will not go back to wander, and wonder and wonder all my life long. 
so it gathered the shells on the shore, shells that glinted and glowed with many hues, shells that were the tempest's spoil from the quiet depths of the ocean, and bound them together with strands of seaweed until a fragile raft floated on the water. Do not tempt us, do not tempt us, blabbed the little waves. But the child took no heed and pushed out boldly from the shore. Then the waves laughed kindly. It is a brave child, they said, and the raft is pretty. So they let it float on the path of the light, and even the wind caught the child's outstretched arms and streaming hair and wafted the little seeker from the shore, and the sun sank slowly through the golden sky to the golden horizon. I shall be in time today, cried the child joyfully, for the light is close on the path beside me. But even as it spoke, the great yellow orb touched the horizon and lay for one instant reflected in the rippling waves the next it sank, sank, sank. Then, with a cry, Oh, wait, please wait, the little child sprang from the raft of shells and followed the sun on the road to nowhere. The kind waves carried it to the quiet world in the depth of the sea, where there is no voice, no sound, and the light shines dim through the changeful currents above. And there the spirit of the little child still lives and wonders, as it wondered before, whither the light goes. So, every now and again, when the dainty Nautilus rises through the blue water sky to unfurl its purple sails in this world of ours, the spirit of the little seeker begs for a place in the pearly boat so that it may try once more to see what becomes of the light when the sun goes out. And that is why the Nautilus is generally seen drifting with all sails set along the ray of rippling light which stretches over the sunset sea from the land of nowhere. End of The Legend of the Nautilus by F. A. Steele Read by Brian Pulling.